of the unceded sacred homeland of the Lenape people who have stewarded this land throughout generations. We acknowledge that the displacement of indigenous peoples and the devastating effect that forced relocation has had on these communities has largely been overlooked and understudied. We acknowledge that the standard curriculum has erased and excluded countless voices and violent truths. We acknowledge that our current and future students are all worthy of the struggle for equity and justice. We acknowledge the impossibility of return for so many of our ancestors. I would also like to express my gratitude for the invisible labor of many who have made this event possible today. At Cooper, thank you to Michael Carrasquillo, Eric Conley, Kim Newman, and the Cooper Union security staff. Kalima DeSus from Cafe Con Libros, Marissa Atkinson, Shana Robinson, Claire Lane, and Yuka Igarashi from Gay, Gray Wolf Press, and Oscar Arias from City View, among others. It's such an honor to host you this evening. In the summer of 2020, with my colleagues in the Office of Student Affairs, we designed a new reading, discussion, and lecture series for incoming Cooper students. In collaboration with the Black Student Union, the Cooper Climate Coalition, as well as various faculty members, we chose the theme, Intersectional Justice. The goal of this program is to interrogate visible and invisible systems of oppression, create conditions where we have shared power, hold, Space, honor and amplify people's labor, discover what we can do together across different methodologies and systems of knowledges, and most crucially, give students language and inspiration to advocate on behalf of themselves. In 1989, professor of law at Columbia and at UCLA, Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, coined the term intersectionality as a lens for understanding the ways that multiple forms of inequity compound themselves and create obstacles that are not understood within conventional ways of thinking. An intersectional justice framework advocates for the systematic, equitable treatment of people of all races, classes, genders, and sexualities that results in equitable opportunities and outcomes for everyone. Within an intersectional justice framework, all people are able to achieve their full potential. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this evening. Titi Dengaramga is the author of This Mournable Body, which was shortlisted for the Booker Prize and is the final chapter of her Tambutse trilogy, which traces the life of a rural girl from her childhood in colonial Zimbabwe to her adulthood in a country repressed by political elites. Dengaramga is also a filmmaker, playwright, and the director and founder of the Institute of Creative Arts for Progress in Africa Trust. She won the Penn Award for Freedom of Expression the Penn Pinter Prize, the Peace Prize of the German Book Trade in 2021, and a Wyndham Campbell Prize in Fiction in 2022. In 2022, she was named one of the Financial Times' 25 Most Influential Women. She'll be in conversation this evening with Margot Jefferson, who teaches in the writing program at Columbia University. She is a recipient of the 2022 Wyndham Campbell Prize in Nonfiction and has published three books. Constructing a Nervous System, a memoir, Negroland, a memoir, which won the 2015 National Book Critics Circle Award for Autobiography, and on Michael Jackson. She was on the staff of the New York Times from 1993 to 2005 as an arts critic. She has also written for numerous magazines and newspapers such as the Washington Post, The Nation, Newsweek, and Salon. Her work has been anthologized in the Mrs. Dalloway Reader, this Best African American Essays, 2010, The Jazz Cadence of American Culture, and elsewhere. This conversation will last about 40 minutes, and then there will be about 10 minutes for your questions, which my colleague and friend, Dean of Students, Chris Chamberlain, will moderate. Welcome, Titsi and Margo. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Nada, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, Kim gave me some context and background about this institution, and I was just amazed because I didn't know, and it made me even happier to be here. Um, I'm going to read briefly from my new book, which is a collection of essays. 
and uh, it's entitled Black and Female, and it's basically an analysis of what brought me to writing and why I continue to write and the themes that engage me um, in my writing. I'm going to read from the first chapter, a few pages, and I've selected this because I think it is one part of the novel, the novel, one part of the book that um, that really, for me, localizes the Atlantic Ocean as a gap, as a wound, as something divisive of something that should have been whole, that is not whole and can no longer be whole again. Um, and I think, for me, it is something that I think about all the time. I remember being in Switzerland, being at a festival in Switzerland, and there was a young um, poet dancer from African American poet dancer, and she said, think about this, six million people who can never go home. And I, that was in the 1990s that I heard that, and I've never forgotten. And uh, I think about the home also that lost the people and what happens in homes when people are lost. So um, that is what I'm going to be reading about when I find the page, which should be in a minute. Um, it's from the first chapter in this book of three essays, which function as an extended essay. And this is the beginning of the essay called Writing While Black and Female. The first wound for all of us who are classified as black is empire. This is a truth many of us, whether we are included in that category or not, prefer to avoid. Today, the wounding empire is that of the Western nations, the empire that covered more than 80% of the globe at its zenith in the 19th century. It includes the British Empire that colonized my country, Zimbabwe, in the 1890s. I was born into empire. My parents were products of empire as were their parents before them, and their parents before that, my great-grandparents. A major early objective of empire was what it called trade. I have that in inverted commas. Trade is premised on desire. Desire without love dwindles into lust. Lust impersonal desire that demands satisfaction is dangerous at every level, the personal, the social, the global. Imperial lust has wounded every part of the world that empire touched, and today we know it has wounded the very planet that is our home. Thus has empire mutilated not only those it, sub it sought to subjugate, but also itself. This is the second wound that affects us all. We are yet to learn how to heal from the effects of an institution that stretches back into time, the time before we were born, but whose systems still work to disempower dispirit and dismember. How this can be done is a question very few dare to ask, because quite apart from not knowing the answer, it often seems there is none. Toni Morrison described certain horrors experienced by some of humankind as unspeakable. But today, those subjugated by empire speak. 
This speaking exposes imperial systems and strategies whose purpose has long been to hide the effects of race in the world. While black people lead in that area of scholarship and activism, others, including white men, though they may kick and scream, are prodded to discuss the world's racialization. Those who, like me, were wounded by the hubris of whiteness, no longer say, I hurt, and self-medicate in self-destructive ways, or act out a ruinous, enraged, and bitter pain on our communities, as that hubris demanded. Today we say, you hurt me. Words that point not to the abjection and death that follow relentless self-mutilation, but to the possibility of removing oneself from the one who hurts, and thereafter transforming oneself into someone the one who hurts can no longer dismember. Look, we who are black or brown, are frequently admonished now that that which is unspeakable is finally being spoken. Why do you speak of damage? Here are the roads, the hospitals. You can read and write. You have medicines. How can you speak of damage? Even before any black or brown person was assimilated into the academic systems of imperial education, and before spaces had, involved, had evolved in empire where these questions could be asked, we had an answer. We said, we feel it. In Steve McQueen's 2013 biographical film, 12 Years a Slave, Patsy, an African descent woman, enslaved on a plantation owned by Edwin Epps, is, sorry, is an African descent woman enslaved on a plantation owned by Edwin Epps. At her arrival, she is in visible grief at being separated from her children. Mrs. Epps orders Patsy to be given something to eat to hasten her forgetting. Patsy's grief is an intense statement that screams, I feel it. To Mrs. Epps, Patsy's grief is simply another instance of meaningless dysphoria amongst household creatures to be dealt with like onion peelings that have fallen to the floor or dust that settles under the bed. It must be swept away. Patsy's statement of effect is ignored. Empire could not bear to hear our screams because it knew it caused them. On the one hand, our expressions of pain are our proof of our living, proclaiming that we are hurting but still breathing. This is why there is a saying in Zimbabwe, Chikuru Kufema, the big thing is to breathe. That which is dead does not feel. We are not dead while we protest. On the other hand, our expressions of pain are a direct threat to the systems of Western empire that rely on the illusion of giving to obtain for itself the best that it covets in the domain of other people. Our expressions of pain say, this is not a gift. Thank you. you just read um, illustrates perfectly what I wanted to, to begin with. Um, 
what you describe as writing as a continual analysis of the interconnectedness of my personal and my national history. And so much of your book um, uses various, you can hear it there, forms, the way trade, for example, that this whole economic moves into the value of that one world, one reality, one system, open and and also gives down energy. Um, so much of your book um, uses language, registers of language, um, forms of language, very clinical analysis, metaphor, um, imagination. Language is historical fact, it's political um, realpolitik political realpolitik, that doesn't quite work, but, um, <laughs> and it's personal revelation and, and imaginative um, symbol. For example, and then I'm going to No good sitting in my lap. This is the opening paragraph um, of Black and Female. I am an existential refugee. I have been in flight since I left the womb and probably before. Given the circumstances I was born into and the effect of these circumstances on my prenatal environment. What you follow is your parents <laughs> living at a high school, um, high school's located at a mission. We, we move back, not surprisingly, to your family. But then a page later, we get a, a very, we begin a very detailed history of Rhodesia. Um, and yes, we go back to the early 20th century, but we go back uh, a number. We go back further than that. We get histories of racial legislation, of the encoding. What I find so interesting is that word, that um, word prenatal. We use it in a very kind of ordinary medical way. You have made it open out into. Uh, the prenatal environment is world history and national history, and it goes back centuries. And that, I find that fascinating. It, it's again, the, the word that seems pretty understood that you, you wrench into another, into another mode. I also um, wanted to, um, to note empire as the first wound, all right? Um, which then later gives way to empire as a guillotine. And I wish you would talk a little about that because that then also moves more into some very intimate particulars of your upbringing um, and your, your childhood even. But that, that violence of moving also from a wound, which we think of as imposed almost one on one physically, to mm -hmm. this I will, yes, <laughs> I promise. And could I have some water, please? Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, th thank you for pointing that out, Margot. I try to do that. I, I try to open up words that we may use in our everyday speech um, to show how they have layers of meaning, depending on your experience. Exactly. So exactly, prenatal, uh, we understand now, we know now, in fact, many people have known for ages, and I think we only forgot um, after the Enlightenment that the child in the womb actually experiences a lot. So now we're beginning to remember that the child in the womb experiences a lot. And uh, so, but when I talk about womb, 
I don't really just mean mine. I mean, uh, or the womb that I was in, mothers, but I mean that whole environment that just states us, as you were saying. So it, it goes back generations. This is why I keep making the point about people being born into empire. And later in the book, I make the point that uh, the kind of empire that I'm talking about from my experience is colonization. That colonization followed another act of violence, which was slavery. And so that's why I started off by saying that sometimes when I think about the Atlantic o Ocean, I think about it as this kind of wound also mm. in that separated two things that yes. should have remained yes. together. Yes, a and so for me, that guillotine idea um, just flows on from that. What kinds of instruments have we had for wounding yes. and for separating historically? And th that instrument, the guillotine, I I is remarkable because um, it, it really was a point in history where things began to separate, you know, with the declaration of the Republic mm -hmm. in France. It, it, it was a real separating of the monarchical past and uh, the, the, the Republican future that we have. I use that in the old sense. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And uh, so uh, to me, it feels as though those acts that have been enacted on black people to separate us um, from our relatives through slavery, to separate us from ourselves through the teachings that we have received from empire, um, are different kinds of guillotine. Which you point out are often presented the teachings as gifts. Here's language, here's law, here's, yeah, here's medicine. Exactly. Here's written literature, here's a canon, here's a literary <laughs> canon. Yeah. Absolutely. And we had all those things before. Maybe we didn't have the writing, but we had the knowledge and we had the memory and we had the systems of retaining knowledge. Yes. Uh, and so that's all guillotined off. Even language today, you know, in Zimbabwe, there is great concern because young people, especially in my part of the country, um, which is not the part of the country where people came up from South Africa, which is Matebeleland, mm. um, but it's the, the country that Rhodes decided to conquer, Cecil Rhodes decided to conquer in order to be able to conquer Matebeleland also and declare Rhodesia. So, and he called it Mashona land, which was a figment of his imagination. Um, so anyway, in that part of the country, we have a situation where the pass rate in this language, which is called Chishona, um, is dropping every year. You know, so we are losing language. And if you lose language, you lose thought. Because if you do not have the concepts to think in, then you cannot think. And this is what we see happening to the youth in Zimbabwe now. And it is not only now because of the direct colonization, but it's also because of the political system. So, yes. All right, so what, how has that political system further advanced this deterioration? Yes, well. <laughs> That's a big question. It's a big one. But the way some Zimbabweans look at it, and this is also how I look at it, is that we had the system of colonization. And in fact, little known is that in the 1950s, and maybe right at the beginning of the 1960s, there was a, a, a movement of multiracialism mm. in Zimbabwe. Mm. And there were white people and black people in the country who understood that unless we resolve this issue, the country is going to go into crisis. And um, white supremacists were against that. But it wasn't only white supremacists. The, there were African nationalists, thank you so much. There were African nationalists who were also against that yes. because um, they felt we have suffered for so long, we don't want this piecemeal um, advancement. And they became really very aggressive 
towards the black multiracialists and call them tea drinkers. You know. Yeah, and there is oh yes, yes. Every <laughs> oh world has its has yeah. its particular insults. All right. Okay. And so this set up that division amongst the nationalists that you are allowed to hate the other black person who does not think as you do. And it also set up the scene for the liberation struggle, um, which began in the middle of the 60s and ended in 1979. And it was one of the most gruesome episodes in the history of Zimbabwe, and because it was extended. So they say the first attack was around 1966, and it ended in 1979, so we're talking about 13 years. And, excuse me, in those 13 years, more black people were maimed and killed and tortured and abducted by a particular group of these um, guerrillas than white people. And this has been the case ever since. So empire has also turned us against ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, and we know also that there are these, um, there is friction between the African populations in the United States and the African American population. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, which one would have thought would not exist, but when you think of the amount of negativity that we have had to consume and simply manage in some way, it then becomes obvious that actually, yes, that negativity will manifest in some way. So um, I really do think that these histories have been so negative that even the idea of overcoming them seems to be Indeed. impossible. Yeah. Seems yeah. to be impossible. Of course it's not. We just haven't found out how to do it. Well, you, you do speak, uh, not as if it were a kind of uh, panacea, a vision. Um, almost utopian, but you do speak of how uh, in, in the psyche, in, in the mind, in the what you call the imaginary, um, that is where, that is one place that, that trans those transformations must take place. Not to replace you know, the political, the, but they must take place or we will keep backsliding. Yeah. You, you are very, very insistent on that, not least when you talk about black feminism um, and you know, the, the selfishness that any movement, be it um, post-colonial, be it colonial, anti-colonialism, be it um, feminism, the, the, the tendency to, be, to self serve oneself and one's, one's kin, one's kind. Yes, uh, you know, Margot, I think that sometimes we underestimate that tendency. You know, we have seen it in uh, white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that we, who are the survivors of white supremacy, can exactly. And yet we have imbibed it because it's part of our environment. And so it's very difficult for us to then look at ourselves and say, in fact, we are exhibiting the very same tendencies. And uh, I think that's where we have to develop a framework for the kind of work that we need to do in order to excavate all that. Um, I, I, I think this is something we have not really started talking about enough. Is that one reason that you chose having written Three, a trilogy of novels, having written screenplays, having written plays, to, in fact, um, write um, a book of essays. What happened, Margot, is that I have done quite a bit of public speaking on the continent. And I love public speaking on the continent because I'm usually speaking to younger people. The older people who are the politicians generally don't want to have anything to do with me. <laughs> well, unless they're thinking maybe we can arrest her. <laughs> but, but the young people 
want to hear what I have to say. So um, I'm invited to film festivals. I'm invited to, to, to literary festivals and this kind of thing. And I really just love that interaction. And so I had all this material. And I thought, well, what can I do with it? I have made this address, given this address to a room full of people, but nobody else has engaged with these ideas. And so that really was the background to putting all those thoughts together in well, that book. Let me ask then um, about some specific um, ideas and observations. A big, a big thing here among African Americans, the word, the term black and its uses yes. and its meanings and its powers and it's when it's righteous and when it's not. Um, you um, speak of melanated people, mm -hmm. as we increasingly call ourselves. You, she speaks of melanated people, um, as we, meaning you and your peers, increasingly call yourselves. Um, you also, whenever you use the word black, you find a way, again, to combine it with other words that, that sever it from a kind of essentialism, even if it's benign essentialism. You will say, um, the source of black embodied labor power. Um, mm -hmm. You will say, you say, the melanin concentration in the skin of black people was and is a convenience. It justified ongoing subjugation. Now, um, tell me about the, um, the melanated. <laughs> this is, um, I, it being, in the, being a U.S. citizen, I'm constantly fascinated by how um, people with a history of oppression, discrimination, obsess over um, what, what words at what periods in their history um, are most honorable in describing them. But you are very careful to separate from uh, black, except as a kind of political, economic, sociological, historical marker. Yes. Um, Margo, you did ask a little bit about my um, childhood experience. I did. And, and <laughs> yes. one of them was being fostered in a white family. Exactly. <laughs> And uh, so in England, in, in England, yes. So that's a whole new other story, and it's in the book. And uh, it's just incredible how self-serving empire is, because actually that was a strategy for certain rather impoverished areas of England to receive the children of people from the colonies who were being educated to go back and continue the colony. And so... Um, as an elite. As an elite, yeah. yes. So, but then we were being farmed out to, to these families that were working class, which didn't make, you know, if you think about it as preparation for being elite, <laughs> it doesn't quite the make English sense. working class, the English white working class you know, is not what and, you want. Well, I, I'm just saying that uh, from a, a policy point of view, it right. didn't seem quite sensible. I was actually very happy, uh, mostly in, in my foster home, and I had wonderful foster parents, but it was just the whole institution. And so it was self-serving, uh, because then uh, these lower-class families received extra money for mm -hmm. looking mm -hmm. after us, so it really wasn't about us at the end of the day. Okay, but to get back to, to the black To now. the black, yes. yes. And so consciousness, yes. I realized that, in fact, I didn't realize it for a long time because, as I said, I had a good fostering <laughs> environment. But then I went to school and um, had a love affair. I was about four or five years old. And uh, my boyfriend suddenly said to me one day, <laughs> As a boyfriend will. <laughs> It's, it's, see, why is your skin so dark? If I hold your hand a lot, maybe it will turn white. You know, so that was something that I put in my heart. And it was my boyfriend, so I couldn't have, you know, and I didn't have the language for it at that time anyway. But then I get back to Zimbabwe, reunited with my family, um, and people say to me, 
Uh, so these people you were with in in England were they people or were they Warung, which is the word for white people? So then I realized that there are people who think that people with different concentrations of melanin are not people. So in fact, that was how I learned that. And it was only later that I realized that it, it worked both ways. <laughs> that if you have less melanin, you think the people with more melanin are not people. And if you have more melanin, you think the people with less melanin <laughs> are not people. Uh, and so that was something that I really had to think about because it didn't make sense to me since the first family that I actually remembered. Um, I was fostered around the age of two, so my first memories were actually of my foster home. So the first family that I actually personally remembered was my white family. And so this is why I have never been able to think of the terms of white or black as actually corresponding to any real category of humanity. But you also have a scene in, in England where you're, you're young, and I think you've been called a little pickaninny. <laughs> yes. Um, and your foster mother has said, because you say, oh, I just got called. You didn't know what it meant. Your foster mother says that's a terrible it word. Was that's used to insult black people. It was actually my mother. Oh, it was your mother. Because I was with my foster mother when oh, this happened. Right, so right. this man says, so, so um, you've got a lovely little pickaninny with you or something. And you know how people, uh, children are sensitive. So I picked up that there was Something. a vibe going on Something. here. And so I didn't talk about it. But when I went back to see my mother in the holidays, because we used to go back in the holidays. That's when. That's when I said to my mom, Mom, you know what I am? I'm a little pickaninny. <laughs> <sighs> and your mother said. And, and she, 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 she hit the roof. She hit the roof. You know, of course and, she did. And I just bless her for that. Because that's when I realized that you do not have to accept the name that people call you. Now, was it after your mother said that, that you, in fact, began to think about the literal meanings of the word black? And you said, my skin, you know, I looked at, black is night. That's, that's black. My skin doesn't look like night. You know, so you really began to just, that kind of child's literal logic. Yeah. take it apart. Was that after your mother had said that? or was it, that it was actually later. It was when I went back to Zimbabwe. All right. Because their race was so in your face. You, you simply could not um, ignore it. In England, to some extent, you could ignore it. Um, and there were things that happened to me that I was not able to frame as microaggressions. You know, even as a child. You know, people they, they yeah. were too extreme. Yeah. And, and you wouldn't know, you didn't know why it was happening to you, especially when you're the only one in the class. Well, so they're only happening to you. If there were three or four of you, and you could see that it's happening to three or four of us, then you could kind of begin to build a hypothesis. <laughs> but if you were the only one, it was difficult. So when I went back to um, Zimbabwe, that's when I began to understand. And you know, you'd have things like, uh, there were missionaries on the mission. Um, and some of the missionaries' children went to the same school that we did. But some of the other missionaries' children did not go to the same school. They were driven into town every day. Their parents drove them the, the 10 miles or so into town so that they could go to the white government schools. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is when I began to question. Because, you know, why do we have this class of white American missionary uh, that allows the children to go to school with us? And why do we have this other class of white American missionary on the same mission who do not want their children mm -hmm. yes. to go? So they clearly have chosen not e exactly. to. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, I want to read um, a passage from actually your novel. Um, the book of Not. Um, and it, it captures um, in a quite scathing um, way 
this um, this kind of terrible awareness um, and the consequences of it. In this case, for being black and female, the central character in the book of Na, in all three of Titi's um, novels, uh, she began secondary school at the best, meaning the most privileged white, with a tiny, tiny number of blacks, uh, st the best school um, in the country, the Young Ladies College of the Sacred Heart. And as you can imagine, these black students are scrutinized and studied, and the students are terrified um, about what do I say touching accidentally um, one of the white students and being reproached or being having a kind of rearing back um, in horror. At this point, um, our, our young woman, um, Tambu, had, she's old enough to be menstruating, and the um, white, which, which teacher is she? The one who, who denounces you black girls, the black girls, for um, choking, <laughs> for the minstrel pads choking up the, the, um, the headmistress. The it the was head the headmistress. <laughs> she announces that some of our black girls um, have done this. Um, they've blocked the toilets, and, and of course attached to this is and how repulsive, you know, that, that, it's, that it's them, especially so. And the um, narrator, Tambu, writes, the situation was this. I was in two aspects, a biologically blasphemous person. This became increasingly clear as I walked my head low to the first lesson. My corporeal crime indicted me on two counts. First were the secretions that dreamt crimson into the dripped crimson into the toilet bowl or stopped with cotton wool, clogged the school's waste system. Then there was the other type of gene, G-E-N-E, -E, that made me look different from the majority of pupils. Even if these others ran the risk, as I did, of rendering waste removal systems dysfunctional, at least they were different in appearance. How was I going to redeem myself? I wondered miserably. What was, what was I going to do, I asked myself. What was within my reach? That's just harrowing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't read and, my and that work. that word blasphemous, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very strong and it's very right. That it, this is something I talk about in, I think, it's the final essay, Black and Female. Yes. Um, and it's the Fanonian concept of uh, negrophobia and how the negro, which is his word, uh, is a phobic, um, a, a phobic being. And so I point out that the negro is not only a phobic being to those who are as negroes, but also a phobic being to, to the self. To the self. And that means to other Negroes also. Yes. You know, and, and this really, for me, explains a lot of what is going on in Zimbabwe now. Mm. Um, we were talking about the phantom limb. Yes. You know, like the shadow. Yes. So we are boxing with our own shadow. And the kind of violence that we see authorities, political authorities, meeting out on citizens in Zimbabwe, to me, has many parallels with the kind of violence that we see within the, co the community mm -hmm. of melanated people on this side of the Atlantic. Ah, yes, yes, you did bring it back to <laughs> this side of the Atlantic, and that's appropriate. Uh, yes. This is one of, one of my, um, it, it's an impulse I have. It, it developed recently when I read a book called The New Age of Empire, by um, a British associate professor in Birmingham called Kenda Andrews. And, and um, it really made me understand how that moment of slavery was absolutely decisive. You know, first of all, we heard the commemoration of the nations that occupied land. First of all, they were removed through genocide. Mm -hmm. you yes, know? absolutely. A and when I hear about things like buffaloes being killed, 
so that people will starve to death. It, it seems as though it cannot be true, but we know that it happened. And then other people are removed from their own environment and put into this new environment. And this came to Andrews with the new age of empire. He was the one who, who really began. Sorry. You know, it's, I can't say sorry because sorry is we Yeah. Yes, he was the one who made it clear that we are dealing with a continuum. Yeah. We, I am going to open this up to questions, but I also just want to note two things. You speak, and this is so interesting and important, of how little we talk about. We know the transatlantic slave trade horse, but how little we speak of how mass removal, mass removal of major citizens, um, of, of, of its population, of its, some of its strongest and, and Hardiest. Yeah, I was hoping to get to that. It was a little bit further down, it's but I realized down, that yeah, um, we, we, d we didn't have to, I didn't have time for that. But, it, but is, yeah. it is there. Yeah, and I, I go on to say, imagine uh, the population of Sweden or the Portugal. population of Portugal kidnapped. Just stricken. Yeah, yeah. Ta taken the away. Land yeah. stricken, yeah. And then add the population of Latvia because I was balancing out the, uh, the numbers. People just come in and kidnap them. Yeah. And then what structures, what hollowed out structures remain? Exactly. What, what happens um, because the systems, what, what we do not really think about enough is that if slavery was a system, there were also systems of enslavement. So now, these systems of enslavement did not begin with supply. They began with demand. Economics tells you that it's a question of fulfilling a demand. So obviously there was a demand mm -hmm. for this system. Mm -hmm. And that is how it grew. And uh, this system that grew undermined the systems that existed. In fact, when the Portuguese went down the west coast of Africa at the end of the 15th century, one of the things they wanted to do was to find polities, nations that were sufficiently developed to be able to trade with. And they found the Kingdom of the Congo. And it, it, wasn't, it didn't take long before that trade developed into the slave trade, mm -hmm. which was because of the buffaloes being killed in order to starve people to death in the Americas. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it sounds as though I'm a bit mad, <laughs> you know, when I talk like this, but that is actually yeah. what happened. And I think it's important for us to collapse time like that so that we could actually understand what we are doing as human beings. And now the result of it is that we have all these repressive governments on, on the continent. And on every continent. I, I, yes. In fact who are acting in the same way, mm -hmm. but they can also only uh, enact w whatever impulses they have on black embodied people also. That's true. Um, thank you for, now we open for questions, um, inviting us into what you call your invisible uh, <laughs> geography, <laughs> which actually you just gave, the invisible as the intellectual reason to geography. Um, just gave an example of, um, we have a few minutes for questions. And this is, this is your program. Thank you all so, so much. And just maybe a quick round of applause to thank you just for that opportunity. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we do have a, a time for a few questions here. So if anyone has something that they'd like to pose, please just pop your hand up and uh, we'll make sure we get a mic over to you. And there we go, first question. How would you speak with the uh, departments? Yes. Um, the 
kind of personhood that existed before interaction with Europeans was adequate for the social systems of the time. That's why they, they, they worked. Um, uh, in another project that I'm working on, I refer often to David Livingston, who went out to South Africa and then to Botswana as a missionary. And he was able to convert one person and uh, this person, back, uh, what do you call it? He slid back, he backslid. <laughs> yes, when, uh, when um, David Livingston left. And so, pondering on his failure, David Livingston came to the conclusion that people were happy the way they were. They liked their legal systems, they liked their food, they like their clothes, they like their uh, social systems, they like their kinship systems. So his conclusion, and he actually wrote this in his diary, or it might have been a letter, I can't remember now, I've been reading his papers. His conclusion was that if the British Crown wanted to be successful in its project of three C's, which were civilization, uh, Christianity and commerce, they would have to destroy the lifestyle that existed. And so that's what they proceeded to do. And so that is why I talk of personhood being destroyed. And so now we have to start rebuilding from there. But I think it's really important for us to understand how it came about. Because unless you know all you have is the end result, which categorizes you as lesser, etc. And it's very important to know um, how this process happened, so that we can even begin to think about strategies of how we can rebuild a personhood that allows us to become thriving human beings and communities and nations today in the context of today. And that is where imagination is required. And I think imagination needs brainstorming. You know, we really, we need those organizations on the continent, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, and then those two sides coming together. And it's beginning to happen. Slowly, it's beginning to happen. But um, I look forward to the process continuing. And that is how we build personhood. I do it by telling my stories about what I have observed. And um, I have young people on Twitter, sometimes to my face, especially young women, coming to tell me that you saved my life. I was on the brink of suicide. Mm. And uh, then, because the point is, people feel that something is wrong, but they are not able to articulate it. So I had these experiences in this foster family in the 1960s. So I am able to articulate things that many young people are experiencing today and they find it helpful. And I think that this is how my ability to use my imagination to put these experiences into narrative form, with, for me, with the express purpose of communicating with people is what I do to try to build personhood. And then they know that, oh, it's not me as, uh, who is wrong as a human being, but I have been stripped of something, and I have a right to go out and fight for it and assert my personhood. And that really is so rewarding for me when young people tell me that. Yeah, we have a couple hands up here. We have a, I can give my mic. Uh, hi, Titi. I just want to say hello. I'm also from Zimbabwe. Um, all of us are from Zimbabwe. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask about, um, you were talking about the Chimurenga War um, and how a lot of people were maimed and killed um, by fellow black people. And I was wondering um, how that is affecting the country now, that intergenerational trauma that's not been... Um, addressed or interrogated um, or even discussed um, because when I went back home I think two years ago and I tried to interview 
um, my, my aunt's friend about fighting in the war. She didn't want to talk about it. Um, and she was like, oh no, that was a long time ago. But this is someone who left to go fight from, from high school. So she was, I think she was 15 years old, so she was very young. But she hasn't interrogated that. And that's a country that hasn't interrogated that trauma that has um, affected every single family. Um, yeah. That's a really huge question. And of course, um, there was no outright win in the war, as these days you never have outright wins. You, you always have conferences where issues are resolved. And I think that because the way the conflict in Zimbabwe was resolved by allowing Britain to become the colonial force again uh, after the end of the war was maybe not the best way. Uh, when we look at other countries, they've had maybe the UN come in. So we, we don't have this um, specter of, uh, of um, empire over us again. So I think we invited the specter of empire back when we had the, the, the British uh, governor coming back and the peacekeeping forces. And I don't think that we have understood that. So we are haunted <laughs> in a way, if you like. And of course, uh, when a specter reappears uh, or appears for the first time, it has its own intentions. So that is something else that is exploited very much. And I, I think people, because we, we, there has not been scholarship, enough scholarship about this, people really do not have the terms in which to think about it. And those people who, who, who do try to express themselves end up getting arrested or whatever, which is why people don't want to talk about it. And uh, somebody like your aunt knows what happened. She knows what happened to people who speak. And so most people will not speak. So it, it, it's an ongoing issue. I think uh, people are incredibly brave in Zimbabwe to attempt anything at all when you look at the history of that liberation struggle and, um, and what happened, what compromises were made, uh, what kind of alliances were made in order to achieve certain goals. You know, I, think, I think we're getting there slowly, much more slowly than we would like, but under the circumstances, I think that progress is being made. And so maybe one day, your aunt will speak to you. Be put in the front. Thank you. Thank We're going to do one more, one more question we have time for, and I've got a hand here. I'll, I can go ahead and give the microphone. Yeah. We'll do two more questions. Um, I just want to also um, say thank you, um, both of you, for being here. Um, I'm from Zambia, so like reading your stories, like really, kind of is very personal to me. And as much as 
this country has given me so much. I feel like it's also taken a lot, um, especially like the whole idea of, hey, you know, in the summers or during the holidays, you get to go back to, you know, home, but it's like, it's not even home anymore. And I think like sometimes I get so upset where you're like, I'm angry with my country for not, you know, providing me with a life that, you know, America was supposed to. But at the same time, I'm angry at America <laughs> because um, recently I just found out like my country is in so much debt <laughs> and a lot of financial institutions have bought bonds to the point that we are technically owned by these companies. And so it's like, how do you not get so consumed with this anger or like being disappointed in yourself for being like, okay, where do I even fall? Like, do I, do I, you know, fall in place with what the American dream is supposed to give me? Or like, do I go back home and try to change things? And it's like, even if I do that, like, where do I even start? So I am like getting really emotional, but um, it's like, you're just, your book is just so beautifully written. And it truly, I do think, is like life changing. And like whoever um, said that you saved their lives, I wholeheartedly believe because I'm slowly starting to heal from, you know, what I've gone through. So, yeah. I I just like to very briefly just respond to that. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the African-American woman in Switzerland who spoke about people not being able to go home. So now we have a continuation of that. People from the continent who come out seeking a better life uh, or maybe the capacity to be capacitated and then find that they can't go home either. So um, I think that there is nothing wrong with being a liminal people. Uh, there are reasons why we are put in these contexts, and I, I say embrace it. Nothing wrong with being a liminal people. I like that. I think we have one more. Yeah, one more question, please. Yes, thank you very much. The, the second uh, essay is about my experience of feminism on the continent, which is old. It began in the early 1980s, just after Zimbabwe's independence. So it will be very diff different from your view. Um, I am hoping that these feminisms that you are speaking about will have more impact. What happened with us is that um, the state took over the feminist movement, and, and so we had a state feminism, and then it was NGOized. Uh, so I really did not see that personal power, that personal passion that should drive that kind of agenda. And I do see it in young people now, and in fact, even uh, in, in young Zimbabwean women, which is amazing <laughs> because Zimbabwe is so patriarchal and it's just so frightening to think about stepping out and you know even if you feel it in your heart so I hear you and I would just like to, to wish people like you and all the other African feminists in their plurality and diversity um, all the best in impacting on that continent just read the last words because they're very, very appropriate from Zizi's book. Forgive me. Give me one minute. It's worth it. 
Oh, it's the passage where uh, Margo, where you speak of uh, people thinking that um, we are super women, that black women are super women because they are simply, um, they are finding ways not only to survive but thrive when no one expected or wanted them um, to. Now that must be at the end of the second at chapter. The, at the end of the second chapter. Yes, okay. Let's get to the end of the second. Yes, I have it. All right. Ha! Ah, our conviction is deep, bolstered by a vivid imagination that reminds us that other realities are possible beyond the one that obtains. We build our theory, we black feminists, as we go, constructing it out of our own experience. It is this conscious positioning of ourselves with no respect to the arena that has been prepared for us. The fact that we have carved out a place for ourselves just as we are in a world that would much rather we did not exist. It is that makes us, the that is quote, worst nightmare. This is why people perceive us as stupid. Yeah. I, I love the force and the little ironic touch at the very end. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both so, so much again. Uh, it, truly an honor. And thank you on behalf of the Cooper Union for the privilege of being able to host this tonight, for all of you to be here today. Uh, as, as Nada mentioned when we first started, this part of our intersectional justice lecture series. Uh, there are more of these lectures that we do. This one's in person. Thank God. This has been an amazing experience. The first one we've ever done in real life. Uh, there will be more of these. Our next one, just want to give a little uh, prep for it. For those of you, it will be virtual. So if you're not around and you want to join us virtually, please do. Uh, it's on Thursday, March 9th at 5 o'clock with Professor Rachel Afi Quinn uh, delivering a talk entitled uh, Doing Gender, Mixed Race, and Visual Culture. Uh, so another really exciting topic. Really hope folks can join again. That'll be virtual, so you can see all the information on our website to sign up for that. Uh, as you may have seen out front, we have... Uh, uh, bleh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, Cafe Con Libro selling uh, books. Uh, we'd love for you to participate in that, buy some books, and continue to support all of this. So thank you all again for coming. Special thank you, Titi and Margot. Thank you so, so much, and have a great night.